One year ago for Christmas, I bought myself an IBM 5154 EGA display. It immediately blew out the magic smoke when we tried to use it in a video. A few weeks ago we restored it together with the matching IBM 5162. We replaced the safety cap that had blown, but unfortunately this 5154 is still quite dead. The IBM EGA card is unfortunately missing the memory expansion card limiting it to 4 colors in 640x350 mode. Luckily one of my viewers, Oliver, had the same problem and designed a replica board. In this video we are going to try to repair the IBM 5154 EGA display and build a replica board for the matching graphics card. This video is sponsored by PCBWay. Thank you PCBWay for supporting this channel. Ok, let's start with the RAM expansion cards. We have actually built quite a few projects on this channel, so these are just a few PCBs that we have got from PCBWay. So if you need a PCB for your next project, check out PCBWay.com. Now let's open this up and take a look inside. Well, as always, these look great. I'll check with Oliver and see if we can make these available. In that case I will put a link down below where you can download these files. As you can see I went for red and gold. It's a bit of a favorite combination for me. To build these up we are going to need sockets, 10 microfarad tantalums, 0 0.047 ceramics, 174 LS04, pin headers to attach to the graphics card, and some 16k by 4 bit RAM chips. Before we start building, we need to do a quick unboxing, because I have dropped my old pine sill too many times, and eventually it broke. I managed to tape it together, so I could use it while I was waiting for this new one. So, so far I've been using the C4 tip, for tinning repair traces, and desoldering large parts, like heat sinks and such. For smaller SMD parts, I've been using this tip here, I'm not sure what this tip is called but it's the smallest tip that was available for the TS100 when I bought it many years ago. For through-hole components, I've been using the D24 tip. But since I had to order a new pine sill, I went ahead and ordered some of the new tips. So let's check these out. Oh, these are absolutely tiny! So this must be the C1. It's sort of like a miniature C4. It's absolutely tiny. I think this one is going to be really useful. Ok, so this one must be the BC2. Same thing here, it's shaped like the C4, but it's about a third of the size. Ok, and this one must be the ILS. Not sure how useful this is going to be. And finally we have this guy here. It's sort of shaped like a knife blade. I'll try it out and see if it's useful. And then we have the actual pine sill. It comes with a tip. But I don't find these useful at all. It's very similar to the ILS, but much larger. I got one of these with my first pine sill, and I don't think I have ever used it. I don't know if they have improved anything since I bought my first one. But it was already good, so that doesn't really matter. I often use two different tips when I work on a project. So instead of swapping tips, I bought a new case for my old pine sill. So instead of swapping tips, I can use two of these and just leave the tip in. Yeah, so this piece here just fell right off. So let's see if we can swap that case. The PCB is held down with two tiny screws. So first we need to move the two push buttons to the new case. And then we've got this part here. That presumably grounds the tip. And then the PCB. And then we've got two of these that are held down with two screws. So when we install the tip, this ring here seems to ground the tip. And these tabs make contact with these metal rings here. By the way, I went for these short tips. They are actually slightly shorter than the regular tips. So now we can put the lid back on. And reinstall all the screws. And then we've got this rubber thing here. Ok, we're done. Yeah, I think that shorter tip is going to be a lot better than the long one. The old pine sill came with this clip here. 
that you can use as a stand. But this time I ordered a couple of these to try them out. Oh, I thought these were made of metal, but they're not. These are actually plastic. Well, I'm not sure about these. Well, I'll give them a try, but I actually think I prefer the old clip. I also got one of these awesome cables that are available for the pine sill. These are really good. I already have one for my old pine sill. So if you're buying a pine sill, don't forget the cable. It's a really good cable. Yeah, really not impressed at all by these stands. So definitely skip these if you're buying a pine sill. I guess I could improve it. Okay, said and done. So now it's shaped like this. Well, that actually improved it. So maybe it's somewhat useful now. I'll give it a try and let you know. Okay, let's start building the expansion card. I'll start with the sockets. And try out the short BC2 tip. Well, it works as expected. But it's not the best choice for through-hole components. I only solder two pins roughly in the middle of each socket. And then make sure that all the sockets are straight and flush. Before I solder the remaining pins. Well, not a difficult project to build. But definitely time consuming. That is a lot of sockets. Now let's do some caps. So these guys all go in between the sockets. Like so. The remaining three caps are 10 microfarad 16 volt tantalums. This is a very common value of tantalums in IBMs. So if you are working on IBMs, make sure to have plenty of these. I still hate this stand, but I tried to improve it somewhat. So I taped two of these together with double sided tape. And then installed rubber feet underneath. So now it doesn't move around as much. But these guys here keep falling down. And it's still worthless. And especially for these short tips. It takes pretty much nothing to make it fall off. It's slightly better for the regular tip. But still pretty crap. So if you have any suggestions for a good stand for the pine sill, then please share. Okay, that was the last ceramic. Next I'm going to install all the RAM chips. This board is mounted to the graphics card. With all these RAM chips facing towards the graphics card. So I want to check the distance before I choose what pin headers I'm going to use. We might as well install the 74LSO4 too. Next up we have the tantalums. This is an earlier revision of the board, so it doesn't have the polarity marked. But the Gerber files I will link to will have the polarity marked on the board. So this cap has the positive lead facing towards me. This guy here has the positive lead facing the other way. And same thing with this cap here. So the only thing left to do now is to install the pin headers. The card is designed to sit on top of the graphics card like this. Oh, I just realized we used up all my standoffs in the previous video when we installed the hard drive in the original Macintosh. This board is going to need standoffs at this end here and it has corresponding holes to install them here. Okay, so I guess we'll bodge it for now and I'll order some standoffs and install them later. I'm not 100% sure, but I think this is the size we need to go with. So let's do a test with just a short piece. Well, the distance between the two boards is probably good. But the pin headers are not stuck all the way in. Let's do a quick test with short pin headers too. No, these are too short. With short pin headers, the chips sit on top of each other. And they are barely coming through the PCB here. So, we definitely need to use this type of pin headers. Okay, so I cut two pieces to size. I'm going to install them in the graphics card and install the expansion card. This way they will be soldered nice and straight while I wait for the standoffs. 
The best I can do is to use this type of clips. This is the only thing left from my old case that I had my original 8-bit VP6 board in. So these were mounted in a chassis and then they had the motherboard on top. And you lock the motherboard by pushing these clips in. A rather unusual solution. I don't think I have seen these in any other case since then. So I'm going to install these in our PCB. So they're not holding the expansion card. But they are pushing the board away from the card. So it's better than nothing. So I need to order standoffs that are roughly 15mm. I found some 15mm standoffs on Amazon. So they are actually already on the way. Okay, that was the last pin. I'll wash this board and leave it to dry while we work on the display. There's one more thing we need to do with this card before we can install it. Tantalums from the 80s are pretty much guaranteed to go bang or short and prevent the system to boot. So I'm going to replace all of these. They are, by the way, 10 microfarad 16 volts. The most common value in IBMs. This turned out to be a very stubborn card. So I'm going to preheat the card with a regular heat gun. It only takes about 20 seconds and helps the desoldering gun to get all that solder out much easier. Well, don't be in a hurry when recapping one of these cards. I had to reflow every single cap and preheat the card six times to get all those caps out. Okay, that was the last cap. Uh, this card should be okay to test now. Okay, let's see if we can fix this display. So we've got two screws on the top of the display here, hidden away by these covers. And the usual disclaimer, of course. Please don't poke around inside CRT displays. They may be charged with high voltages, even with the cord unplugged. Underneath the display we have two screws up here and two more screws down here. These two are holding the main PCB inside, so I'm gonna leave them on for now. And pull the cover off. It actually still smells exploded safety cap. So first we need to remove this large shield. Uh, then I'm going to disconnect the neck board and pull it off. When I do a project like this, I take pictures of all the connectors, just in case one of them isn't obvious when we reassemble the display. Next we need to remove this panel here with a large connector underneath. And then we can disconnect the video board. That frees up this panel here so we can move it and get better access. And now we can remove the video board. I'm moving quite quickly here because we have already disassembled this display in a previous video. The video board is connected to the main PCB with a connector here. And now we can remove the power supply. Same thing with the power supply. It's attached to the main board with a connector and a whole bunch of cables underneath. And lastly, we can remove the main PCB with the two screws underneath the display. The video board is installed in this large can, presumably for shielding. With the lid off, we can disconnect the main cable and pull the board out. The power supply was put together with rivets. I left them out. I will show you why in a minute. So we need to remove one more screw. The wires for the IC connector are soldered to the board. So let's remove it too. So we can get rid of that shield. Okay, here's our power supply. We have previously replaced these two safety caps. Because the cap in this position here had blown up. And made a bloody mess of this board. When preparing for this video, I did some basic troubleshooting and immediately found a completely dead cap. When measuring this cap, I'm getting absolutely nothing on the meter. I had to look through my stuff and I found a very cheap no-name cap and replaced it. But that didn't make any difference. This display is still completely dead. Well, maybe I shouldn't say completely dead, because we do get high voltage, but no image. So our main suspect is actually the video board. But since I found a completely dead cap on this board, I think it only makes sense to replace all of these caps. Oh, I just noticed something interesting here. This solder joint here is cracked. Unfortunately, it was just this heatsink. So we're not quite that lucky. 
That would have been a nice easy fix. I'm gonna replace that cheap cap that I had installed. Probably not a great cap. I went through every single cap and made a list before I ordered caps for this project. I generally don't recap stuff unless it's a board that is known to go bad or if I found a leaky or faulty cap like in this case here this board is designed for two different lead spacings like with this cap here that made it slightly easier to order caps okay we have some kind of liquid underneath this cap here it's not coming off with a dry q-tip so probably flux because electrolyte tends to come off with a dry q-tip solder is coming off very easily on this board so this should be a pretty simple recap. Oh, this cap is sticky. Yeah, this is definitely cap juice. It's very sticky compared to flux. And it comes up with a dry q-tip. So this is the same brand as the other cap I measured that was completely dead. So let's replace it with a brand new Nichicon. I ordered a mix of Worth and uh, Nichicon caps. And maybe a few Panasonic, depending on what was available for a quick delivery. So we've got two very large caps in the middle of the PCB here. They actually have four legs, but from what I can tell, two of the legs are not connected to the PCB. So I'm going to replace them with regular two-leg caps. Yeah, check out these guys here. So two of the legs are connected to the PCB. It's a really big cap, so maybe it needs four legs to stay on the board. It has some liquid close to it here, but it's not sticky and it's not coming off with a dry Q-tip. So that's probably flux. Just the tiniest amount of liquid here and it's flux. As you can see, this and this pad here, they're not connected to any traces. So only these two pads here seems to be in use. I wasn't able to match these guys perfectly. So I had to go much higher in voltage. And apparently I went with Kemet brand. Probably wasn't much to choose from. So from what I can tell, these are the two pads in use. And luckily, they actually fit this cap. Well, sort of. It ended up sitting on top of these resistors. Okay, this one fits better. It's just touching the ceramic here. So I don't really like this. I hope it's not going to cause any problem. The PCB hasn't gone black from heat here. Like it has on many other places on this board. So hopefully these two guys here are gonna stay cool enough not to cause any trouble. Okay, I skipped ahead here. So that was actually the last cap in the power supply. I also decided to reflow all the legs of all the coils on this board just to make sure they aren't cracked and I fixed the cracked leg of that heatsink well since we have high voltage this is not our main suspect so let's put it aside at least for now the neck board only has one cap and somehow I managed to remember to order it this board however has a plastic shield at the back so we need to pull that thing off to get access to that cap. Well, these clips were not easy to remove. Oh, well, these guys are melted in place. Well, I think I can reach at least one of the legs with a desoldering gun. Luckily, that solder comes off very easily. Okay, I managed to reach both of the legs. Uh, we've got something white underneath this cap. And it came off with a dry Q-tip. So, another leaky cap. That's a bad Rubicon for sure. 2.2 micro, 350 volts. This could quite possibly cause our issue with this display. Not an easy cap to replace without damaging those clips. But let's try with some tape. Yeah, this should work. Bit tricky to get on camera. And I managed to solder it by pulling on that plastic piece with some sticky tape. Okay, let's fix the main board. 
from what we have seen so far, I'm gonna guess these two golden caps are bad. And perhaps this Rubicon here. These Nichicons are probably good. This board is quite large and a bit difficult to get on camera. So I'm gonna replace some caps here and skip ahead until I find something interesting. Okay, main board recapped. The only thing I found was a leaky Rubicon here. I also reflowed all the coils on this board. Just to make sure we don't have any cracked solder joints. Next we have the video board. This was my main suspect. But since we found a leaky cap on the neck board, I'm not so sure anymore. I guess this could have been caused by the power supply too. I'll do the same with this board here. I'll start recapping off camera. And I'll turn the camera on if I find anything interesting. Well, that didn't take long. I was inspecting the board while I was waiting for the desoldering gun to heat up. And check out C605 here. This cap has leaked so badly, one of the legs actually has green corrosion. So perhaps my assumption that we would find a fault on the video board may actually have been correct. Well, in any case, that cap is definitely bad. Well, I found something unusual here. I was just about to replace this cap here. And as you can see, the board has gone black from heat. But it doesn't seem to come from the resistor, as one would expect. Instead, the heat seems to come from the cap itself. And the same thing here with C605, that is all green from corrosion. The board is all black underneath too. I thought the heat came from this transistor, or perhaps this resistor here. But I don't think that's the case. It actually looks like the heat has come from this cap here. And here's another one. Check out those green legs. And the board underneath has gone all dark. So, boiling hot electrolytics. What the heck is up with this board? Well, I'm almost done here. I found a few more of these with green legs. And this guy here is clearly leaking. There's a very sticky liquid underneath. Okay, a freshly tested 5160 hooked up to the CGA display. This 5160 has an AST 3G256 Plus card. It can show EGA graphics on an EGA display, and EGA-like graphics on a CGA display like it's doing now. The only thing we need to do to use it with an EGA display is to move this jumper here to ECD mode. Okay, so we're ready for a test of the display. The 5154 is now hooked up to the AST 3G+. Okay, let's turn the power on. Well, no magic smoke, so let's turn it on. We've got high voltage. Fingers crossed. Well, I'm getting nothing on the display. Let me check those pots at the back. No, unfortunately, I'm getting absolutely nothing on that display. That sucks. Just high voltage, but no graphics. With the display disconnected from the graphics card and turned on, it's still a black screen. So this display isn't producing any graphics at all, because I think the display should be all white when it's disconnected from the card. Okay, I had a look online and I found Sam's schematics for the 5154. On page 11 I found all the voltages. I have removed the can from the power supply and installed it back on the main board. So let's turn the power on and check some voltages. On the pin labeled number 7 we should have 154 volts. Let's see what we get. 154.9 volts. So that pin is good. On the pin labeled number 4 we should have 56.7 and we have 57.2. So not spot on. On pin label number 5 we should have 21.2 volt. If I can reach it behind that cap. 21.2 volts. That's spot on. On the next pin here we should have 12 volts. 12 spot on. And then we should have minus 6.3 volts on the pin label 8. But we don't. We've got nothing on that pin. So is this our issue? Okay, let's see what we can find here. So here's the pin. And it's this one here. 
So if we flip the board, it's this pin here, and it's going to this component here. So that's this resistor here. According to Sam's, it should be a 0.56 ohm resistor. Let's check it, and it's showing up as 0.67. That's not too far off. At the other end of the resistor, it's going to this pad here and these two. Okay, interesting. That first pad is actually to the only cap that was completely dead on this board. And the other two pads are going to these two resistors. I can't read the color bands anymore. The paint is just completely falling off. I can make out the bands, but I can't see what color they used to be. They have all gone sort of grayish. Uh, just by touching these resistors, the paint is chipping off. So they have seen some serious heat. According to Sam's, they should be 1.2 ohms each. They are connected in parallel, so we're not going to get an accurate reading. So let's see what they are. 222 mega ohms. That is quite far from 1.2 ohms. So I think we have two dead resistors here. Yeah, check out the PCB underneath those resistors. That PCB has seen some serious heat. Let's measure these guys again. I'm getting nothing on this one. Above this resistor here. No, I'm getting nothing on these resistors. Yeah, these resistors are toast. They're not showing up as resistors. Unfortunately, I can't read these colors. So I can't check if Sam's is correct about the values. I looked through my stash and I found these guys. Let's hope they can dissipate enough heat. Uh, perhaps I'll order some beefier ones and replace them later. These resistors are then connected to this transformer here. So there's no obvious reason to check more components. Instead, let's do a test. Okay, power supply back in the display. Let's turn the power on. And turn the display on. So let's check that first pin to make sure we... Oh, we're getting something on the screen. Let me move that camera. Check this out. So that definitely made a difference. Let's see what we've got on that pin. Minus 6.5. Not quite 8. Okay, hooked up to the 5160. Let's turn the display on. Um, we're getting that white flickering. Let's turn the IBM on. Okay, the display went black. Haha. <laughs> yes! It's posting! Awesome, we fixed it! Yes! Let's check out those colors. Never had a working EGA display, so I'm not sure what to expect here. But this is looking pretty good. Well, I'll see if I can find some pictures online and compare the colors and do some adjustments. But this is looking pretty good. Now let's flip the display around and check the temperature of those resistors. They are 132 Celsius. That's a bit too toasty. I'll see if I can find something beefier and replace them. I have an assortment of adjustment tools for pots. But I didn't have these two guys here. So I pulled these knobs out of these two pots here. And used them to adjust these pots too. Apparently that is some weird size. Well, I'm not sure about the colors. But this looks pretty good to me. So I'm gonna leave it like this for now and probably do some more adjustments later. So let's start with a quick test without the expansion board. Okay, graphics card swapped. Let's turn it on and see what we get. Oh no, we're <laughs> getting nothing. Oh yes. Okay, we've got something, but it doesn't look good. Something isn't quite right. Well, I reinstalled the AST card and now the flickering is gone. So it's definitely something with that graphics card and with the original IBM card. The text is now moving again. It looks like it could be interference. I used some deoxide on all the connectors and put the lid back on the PC, but that didn't help. 
So now I have reinstalled the can on the power supply. Let's see if that makes a difference. Let's turn the display and the PC on. No, it's still flickering. So something is unfortunately wrong with that graphics card. Well, it basically only has some tantalums, a few ceramics and a bunch of chips. The tantalums are brand new and I have checked and they are installed correctly. Ceramic caps rarely go bad. I actually have something similar in the Apple II project. The text is moving around slightly. Well, this kind of sucks. So you fix one thing and then the next thing breaks. Well, I'd call this a win anyways. After all, we fixed the 5154 today. So now we need to repair the matching 5162. That thing has a pretty tricky fault, but we'll figure it out somehow. I'll probably troubleshoot the IBM EGA card and test the expansion board in that video too. If you're watching this in the future, there will be a link to that video on the screen shortly. If you're watching this fresh, hit the bell icon below and set it to all. And now is a good time to watch this video. I will end by saying thank you to my patrons, I appreciate your support. If you want to support me too, consider becoming a patron. Patrons get ad-free early access. If you want to help me make more videos like this, like and leave a comment. If you're a regular viewer, consider subscribing to this channel. Thank you for watching, I'll see you next week.